can everyone can everyone hear me? Excellent. Okay, well, welcome back after lunch. And I want to thank the organizers for inviting me here today. It's been a great meeting so far, and I'm really looking forward to, to the talks later in the day and in the rest of the week. So I was asked to give a review about the coevolution of disks and, and planetary systems, and that's sort of a large topic for half an hour. So I've sort of chosen to condense it down a little bit, and I'm going to talk about planets in evolving protoplanetary disks. And basically, sort of a talk of two halves. I'm going to talk about disk evolution for half the talk, and then at the end, maybe, or two thirds maybe, and then talk about uh, planet formation and planetary dynamics towards the end. Um, and so the basic motivation for this is that, that planets form in disks. And we know that there are, I've got the cartoons which my PhD student has drawn, which are much better than anything I could draw. And I also want to thank uh, Gaspar for giving me the image he showed yesterday, so I'm no longer showing HH30, I'm now showing this one, which looks even nicer. Um, so we know that planets form in disks, and we know that by the time you get to the weak line t star phase, or the debris disk phase, there's not enough mass left to form certainly gas giant planets, and, almost, and possibly uh, even terrestrial planets. And so this is the planet forming era over here. But more than that, during the disk phase, most of the mass and most of the angular momentum is in the gas. And so the gas dominates the dynamics of forming planets and of planets once they've formed. And so if we all want to build a predictive, detailed model of planetary systems and how planets form and how the systems evolve to be the mature exoplanet systems that we observe at a billion year ages, then we really have to have a proper understanding of how the, the gas in the disk evolves. And if you, want, if, I, if you take one thing away from this talk today, I want it to be that the disks evolve. Disks are not static objects. And you can sort of observe this in a number of ways. Um, the classic plot is the one shown here, which is, I guess, a variation on the, the Heisch plot, which tracks, in this case, both the inner disk infrared excess fraction, which traces the inner dust disk, and the accretor fraction, which traces the inner gas disk, as a function of, of cluster age in a number of young stellar clusters. And the typical, you know, in the youngest clusters, almost all the sources have inner dust and gas disks, and they also have millimeter fluxes and evidence of gas at large radii. And by the time you get to 5 to 10 million years old, most of the disks are gone. There's only a small fraction of disks live for longer than, than 5 to 10 million years. And so what I take away from that is that the typical disk lifetime is a few million years with a lot of scatter. Some disks are gone by a million years. Some disks live for 10 million years or, or, or longer. On top of that, you can also then look at individual systems and the properties of individual disks. And there's sort of two plots I added here to highlight this. This is from a uh, paper by Lee et al., but the data are actually from, from Anderson Williams. And this is... Uh, disk mass is measured from the millimeter continuum in the way that Sean talked about yesterday. And what you see is there's a lot of scatter. The typical disk mass is of order a percent of the, of the, center, the stellar mass or so. Um, but there's a lot of scatter. The most massive disks are 10, 20 percent of the stellar mass. And they go all the way down to, to sort of Jupiter mass and below. Um, and at the same time, we observe disks accreting. And this was uh, sort of still almost the state of the art in terms of disk accretion for, for solar mass stars. Um, these are individual accretion rates measured for young T tauri stars by looking at the, the U-band and the ultraviolet excess. So this is a technique that was pioneered by Hartman and Calvert and collaborators in the, in the late 90s. And basically what you do is you measure the accretion luminosity in the, in the U-band and the ultraviolet, convert that to an accretion rate, and what you see is that the typical accretion rate for T tauri stars is of order 10 to the minus 8 solar masses per year, again with a lot of scatter. And so that allows you to say something beyond simply disk lifetimes. We know that disk lifetimes are are a few million years, but we can also define an accretion time scale. You just say, observationally, if we measure m disk over m dot, the measured accretion rate, that means that most disks evolve typically on time scales of around a million years. And so we know whether or not these two things are related, we expect disks to evolve substantially over the million year lifetimes that we observe them to live for. And so, let not move forward. The, the point I wanted to, to highlight is that planets form in evolving disks. There's no one set of conditions that is the, the canonical conditions for planet formation. Disks have a wide range of properties that change over their lifetime. And we re, if we want to have, you know, try and reproduce the observed diversity in, in both disks and also in extrasolar planets, we really have to start thinking about disk evolution in, and in our planet formation models and try and consider evolving disks rather than disks as a fixed static object. Now, the other thing we can talk about observationally is that the end of the disk lifetime, the clearing phase, where you go from the disk, the transition from the disk to the no disk phase, um, happens quite quickly, and when it does happen, it's extremely efficient. Now, the, the quickly part comes from the, the sort of statistical argument which is highlighted here. This is a plot I've borrowed from Lucas Chiesa, which shows the, the Spitzer color. So basically, optically thick disks are over here. These are sort of optically thin disks, and no disks are over here. 
And on the vertical axis is the disk mass measured from the millimeter continuum, so the dust mass converted to a disk mass. And what you see is essentially almost all of the objects which have optically thick disks are also massive and detected in the millimeter. Almost all of the disk-less objects have no detectable disk mass. And there are very, very few objects with partial disks. And typically, it's a few percent up to 10% of objects with you know, partial or transitional disks. And this is interpreted basically as an, an app, the, the, the transition from disk to no disk must be fairly rapid. Because if it was a smooth transition, you would expect a smooth distribution of, of objects, and that's not what we see. These things are tracing very different regions in the disk. These are sort of the infrared is at the sort of AU type scales. The millimeter mostly comes from 50, 100 AU and beyond. And all these signatures seem to go away at the same time. So disks ha are cleared across their entire radial extent and, and pretty quickly. The exact time scale is sort of a subject of debate, but certainly on a time scale, a factor of several to 10 shorter than the disk lifetime at least. And then when the disks are gone, they're really, really gone. So um, surveys that have looked for, for gas in particular around evolved objects, weak line TTRI stars and, and debris disks, invariably don't find anything. They get upper limits. And so this is from Ilaria Pascucci's work with Spitzer. This is the FEPS data. So these are mostly debris disks and a few young objects where they went looking for infrared row vibrational transitions of H2, didn't find anything. And the upper limits they set, as you can see, these are surface density upper limits, um, which are the factors of sort of 10 to the 4 or more below the canonical surface density of a, of a protoplanetary disk, minimum mass solar nebula. And in fact, more recently, Laura Ingleby and Ted Bergen and Nuria Calvert and collaborators have repeated this exercise, but looking in the UV, where you're looking for the electronic transitions, which are fluorescently excited. And the upper limits they get are even stricter, down at the kind of depletion factors of 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8, compared to a canonical disk. So what this tells you, when the disk is cleared, it's, it's really, really clear. There's really nothing left once the, once the disk is gone. And by the time you're at these kind of surface entities, there's, not near, there's, there's so little gas, you're not going to form planets, by, uh, gas giant planets by that point. Anything that you want to do planet formation-wise has to happen before the clearing phase. And so that's the observational summary. Um, the physical processes that we think drive evolution over most of the disk lifetime, not, not at the earliest phases, but over the T-Tori phase and, and towards the, the weak line phase, um, are accretion and then photoevaporation. And accretion is sort of essentially something akin to classical accretion disk theory. We think that um, disks are turbulent, as shown in this figure that I lifted from Phil Armitage's annual review, um, where uh, MHC turbulence, probably driven by the MRI, drives turbulent stresses in the disk. Those stresses um, transport angular momentum outwards, and that allows mass, when it loses its angular momentum, to accrete inwards. And on long secular timescales, that gives you something akin to classical viscous accretion disk theory, where the, most of the mass accretes inwards onto the star, and the disk expands to conserve angular momentum. And you get a sort of homologous power law evolution over, over a million year timescales. That's what we think accretion does. But then later on in the lifetime, when the accretion rate gets low, we also think that the photoevaporation matters. And the basics of photoevaporation are very simple, and I'm not going to get into the, the details in, a, in, in, a great, in great detail here, but uh, the, the basic principle is that high energy radiation, either UV or X-rays, either from the central star or from an external star, like a nearby O star, can heat the disk surface layer. And you typically heat up to a few thousand, up to 10 to the 4 Kelvin, depending on exactly what the incident flux and spectrum is. And then if you have a hot layer on the disk surface like that, when you get high enough, far enough away from the star, so high enough up the gravitational potential, the hot layer is unbound and just flows off the disk as a thermal wind. And the, uh, the critical radius depends on the, the temperature of the gas, which in turn depends on what, spec what uh, photons are driving your heating. And basically, there are three regimes that matter. There's the, non the H2 dissociating but non-ionizing far ultraviolet. There's the ionizing extreme ultraviolet. And then there are X-rays. And we know that young stars are, are pretty bright in all of these, these bands. Um, we know in certain cases, such as the proplids that uh, Zoe showed the beautiful pictures of this morning, those are being irradiated by nearby O stars, and they're driving copious mass laws from these disks at very young ages. But most stars are not close, most young T tauri stars are not close to O stars, and most stars are not subjected to external irradiation, but the central stars irradiate their own disks and drive significant mass loss, and what I'm going to call internal mass loss. Now, the critical radius where you launch the wind that most of the mass loss comes from depends on how hot the disk gets. Basically, the hotter it is, the, the hotter your layer gets, the closer in your critical radius gets. But it's typically a few AU. It's sort of down at 1 to 2 AU for, for EUV. It's a little colder and more like 5 to 10 AU for the FUV and the X-rays. And the mass loss rates from these winds are, are potentially quite significant. The estimates range from, from the models, they range from 10 to the minus 10 solar masses per year up to 10 to the minus 8 solar masses per year for the more recent models that the X -ray and the, with X-ray and FUV irradiation. Um, now, that's 
almost comparable to accretion rates in some cases. And so if you want to consider the effect of this on longer time scales, you have to couple photo evaporation to, to accretion. And the schematic picture we have is something like this, where you have the you know, disk viewed edge on, there's planets forming, there's dust forming, there's settling going on, there's turbulence transporting angular momentum and driving accretion. And then in the upper layers of the disk, you have the photo evaporative flow being driven by the photons from the central star. And when you couple these things, two things together in a, in a secular evolution model, you get a picture that looks sort of like this. And I've taken the figure from one of my papers, but the, the behavior is pretty generic for all of the models in this class. Basically, there are three phases to the evolution. There's a viscous phase where the accretion rate through the disk is much larger than the, the wind rate, and so the, wind primarily, the disk primarily evolves due to accretion. Once you wait long enough, because the mass reservoir is finite, the accretion rate declines with time. And eventually, you reach the point where the wind rate is roughly comparable to the, the accretion rate, because the, the wind is driven by the uh, chromospheric emission and coronal emission from the star, which doesn't couple to accretion. Once that happens, you basically, you're, you're at this, round about the critical radius, your wind dominates over the accretion flow, you open a gap in the disk, and once you open the gap, the inner disk drains viscously onto the star quite quickly, and once the inner disk is gone, you can then evaporate the disk from the inside out. And these two phases are quite, quite, quite short compared to the, the disk lifetime. And this behavior is pretty generic, to the, regardless of what the heating mechanism is. You get this sort of rapid, you get a gap opening phase and rapid inside out clearing after a long lifetime. The exact ratios of the time scales depend on your disk conditions, your viscosity prescription, your wind prescription, but the quality of the behavior is almost more, always more or less the same. Now, I've got one slide about what dominates the winds. The answer is we don't really know at this point. Um, the, the models are, are fairly mature and robust, and we've got to the stage essentially where the major uncertainties in photo evaporation models are, are the input physics. Um, in the case particularly of the EUV, we don't really know what the ionizing luminosities of t tauri stars are, and it's very hard to determine that observationally. For the X-rays, and particularly for the FUV, the dominant uncertainties are more to do with um, chemistry and dust physics, because a lot of the absorption is due to dust or heavy elements, and so if you have settling or if you change the pH abundance, you can change the results quite significantly. And so that's where the uncertainties in these models lie. But I guess the, the, the controversial prediction recently by the, particularly the X-ray and the FUV models is that the, the high wind rates that they get, sort of 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 8 solar masses per year, actually suggest that mass loss might be more important than accretion over the, over the million years' lifetimes. I'm, not, I'm agnostic as to whether or not I believe that, but uh, that's sort of the prediction. And this figure illustrates this qualitatively. So this is three, the same disk model, or just a toy disk model, run with the canonical wind for the three different cases. And it's accretion rate against time normalized to the disk lifetime to make it clear what's going on. So the accretion rates drop as a power law and then they're shut off once the gap opens and the accretion stops. And the rate at which they're shut off depends on the wind rates. The EV and the FUV models cut the accretion off at a higher rate. The dashed lines are on the right-hand scale and that's the total integrated mass lost to the wind over the entire disk lifetime. And what you see is for the low EUV models, which are the sort of classical ones, I guess, where the mass, rates are, mass loss rates are, rates are low, you lose a few Jupiter masses in total over the entire disk lifetime. So it's really, it's driving final disk clearing, but it's not really doing much for most of the disk lifetime. When the mass loss rates are higher, that's not true. You're actually removing, you know, a percent, maybe even more of, the, of a solar mass over millions of years. And because you're, you, you're removing preferentially the upper layers, it's gas-rich material you're removing, this has potentially quite a profound effect on things like disk chemistry and dust-to-gas ratios. And this hasn't really been looked into in a great deal of detail yet, but it's something that's worth, worth looking at in the future. Now, before I move on to talk about planets in a bit more detail, I'm going to point out that we do actually observe photoevaporation directly now. Uh, this is no longer just a theoretical uh, discussion. This is, um, so basically we can see blue shifted emission lines for, that come from the photoevaporative wind, and these have been observed now in about 15 or so sources, with mostly with the VLT. Um, and this is the best case. This is TW Hydra from Ilaria Pascucci's work. And the, the black histogram is the, is the spectrum from VLT Vizier. And this is the neon 2 mid-infrared fine structure line. And this is the critical density of around about a few 10 to the 5. So it comes from pretty close to the base of the photoevaporative flow. And from coupling the hydro models to simple radiative transfer, you can make predictions for the line profile. And they're shown as the red and the blue for two canonical cases. And what you see is that the, the main prediction is the, line, is the line width is broader than thermal, but not very broad for a face-on disk. But there's also, for a face-on disk like TW Hydra, a significant blue shift of around about 5, 6, 7 kilometers per second, depending on exactly what the the inclinations. And this is seen at very high signal noise now. This is the, the best, basically the, the blue shift observed in the line is, is sort of five plus or minus one kilometers per second. It's clearly detected at high signal to noise. And regardless of exactly how the wind is being driven, 
the line alone is an absolutely unambiguous detection of a low-velocity ionized wind. So these things are losing mass. They're losing mass in a, at least a partially ionized wind, and the mass loss rates are potentially significant. We can't yet measure mass loss rates empirically. The difference between these two models is essentially that one is a fully ionized wind with low density, and the other is a partially ionized wind with high density. So they have the same number of neon-2 atoms in them, and so you get the same flux. Um, but if you start to look at other lines from the neutral gas, then you can potentially start to distinguish between the different models and measure mass, rates, mass loss rates empirically. And I thought I'd highlight Elisabetta Rigliaco's poster on looking at the, the neutral oxygen lines, which is potentially a very interesting way of, of measuring mass, getting towards photoevaporation rates empirically rather than relying entirely on the models. So that's basically my summary of disk evolution. But I thought before I go on to talk about planets finally, I would highlight a very interesting new development, which I know surprisingly little about, but I'm going to summarize as best I can. And that is that a bunch of simulations recently um, by two or three, sort of two and a half different groups, I guess, because there's some overlapping authors, um, have looked at shearing box simulations of disks with vertical magnetic fields. And if you have a net vertical field, you almost invariably get some sort of mass loss in a turbulent shearing box simulation. And these are, you know, the mass loss rates are potentially quite significant. They see mass loss rates where they deplete the mass in the in the box on, on timescales of a few hundred orbits. And they're still just local simulations. They haven't been able to move up to global simulations yet, although I noticed that Juning Bai had a paper yesterday where he suggested mass loss rates as high as 10 to the minus 8 solar masses per year. And so this is, the simulations that have been done are still not detailed enough to make detailed predictions, but the, the local results basically suggest that actually for some range of parameters, particularly if you have a dead zone, mass loss rate in a magnetic wind can actually dominate the angular momentum evolution even at AU radii, not just down close to the star where we get jets and things launch, launch from. These are further out. These are wider angle, lower velocity winds. And I'm going to speculate wildly in the bottom point here and say that there's this, I think, is a potential link. There have been these low velocity molecular outflows observed in CO from very compact regions. These come from radii of a few AU, and nobody really knows where they came from. But I think MRI winds are a potential explanation for those outflows. I'm not going to say anything more about that other than to, to highlight those things and then, and then move on. So this is a, a ver rapidly evolving field, and I think it's going to be very interesting to watch what happens in the next few years in terms of MHD-driven mass loss. But I'm going to move on now and say planets. What does this mean for planets? And there's a whole host of things that uh, disk evolution does to planet formation and how it affects planetary systems. And I've sort of summarized them here. As I said at the beginning, disks evolve. Disks are not static structures. And the disk conditions that planets form in change quite a bit between the beginning and the end of the disk lifetime. And we have to sort of think that planets must form in a variety of different conditions and consider that in our models. Mass loss from the upper layers of the disk through winds is almost always preferential, preferentially removing gas because the dust and the heavy elements settle. And so uh, mass loss changes both the dust to gas ratio and potentially the disk chemistry. And both of those matter quite a lot for, for planet formation and for planetesimal formation. Um, when you change the disk structure radially, you can make pressure gradients, you can form traps, you can trap dust, you can trap planetary cores, you can do all kinds of things. And then finally, the, the final clearing of gas disks definitely stops planet migration. Planet migration may get stopped in other ways, but when you get rid of the gas disk, giant planets stop migrating. And so all of these things matter, and uh, at the moment, most planet formations don't look into the models don't look into them in detail. I've highlighted a few talks that are going to discuss various things on this list and others um, over the next few days. But I guess my main point is that basically we think we understand disk evolution reasonably well now. We don't really understand the impact disk evolution has on, on planet formation and on the evolution of planetary systems. And so rather than try and talk about all of these things frantically in, in 10 minutes, what I'm going to do instead is focus on one of them, the last one, and talk about some work I've done recently looking at how disk evolution affects planet migration and how we can try and couple observations of disks to observations of planets to figure out what's going on in, in young disks. And so... I always think this, title, this slide should have an exclamation mark, but maybe not. Um, <laughs> the basic premise is that if you, it, theoretical models tell us that when you put a planet in a disk, it interacts tidally with the gas disk. You get tor resonant torques, and the torques are almost always unbalanced, so they always cause the planets to migrate. And the direction of the migration is almost always inwards, and the time scales are almost always short compared to the disk lifetime. And so if you want planets to survive, if you don't want them to all get swallowed up by the central star, you have to either slow or stop migration somehow. And for type 1 migration, that's low mass planets, planetary cores and, and things of Neptune mass are lower. There are lots of different ways to do that by playing with the disk structure, temperature gradients, entropy gradients. All of these things can cause traps and stop migration. For giant planets, Jupiter mass and above, 
they open a gap in the disk because their torques are much stronger. And they basically move inwards with the accretion flow. And so as long as disks are accreting, giant planets migrate in the type 2 regime. And the most sensible and plausible way to stop type 2 migration is to get rid of the gas disk. And so disk dispersal, and in these models by photoevaporation, is a way of stopping planets from migrating. And so what, um, what I've been working on, what a, this is a series of papers with, with Phil Armitage and with Ilaria Pascucci, we basically took a sort of minimal population synthesis model, if you like. Take the simple ingredients that we think we understand, so an, an alpha disk with photoevaporation, put in a standard 1D approximation for type 2 migration, and then just randomly form planets in the disk and let them migrate. And then we integrate these models explicitly. This isn't a population synthesis sort of parameterized calculation. We form, do an individual model, integrate it explicitly over millions of years, and then run large numbers of models, sort of thousands, to generate statistical samples. It's essentially the ugliest population synthesis calculation you've ever seen. It's much less sophisticated in terms of the, in, the range of parameters than the kind of thing that, that Doug and Ida and Mordesini and collaborators have done. But because we're putting in less physics, we have a better handle on what individual processes how individual processes affect the outcome. And basically the aim is to try and build a model that we can test against both disk observations and planet observations. So we can test against the million year old disk observations and then the exoplanet distribution at giga years. And so what we do is something in the movie here highlights how it works. We run individual models. So this is accretion rate against time. But these are full 1D disk models where you track the surface density at all radii. And you run a range of different model parameters. You inject planets randomly and they suppress the accretion and they get swallowed up. And you build up lots and lots of models and you build up a distribution. And then we can test basically the distribution of accretion rates against what we see and it's more or less consistent. Um, and we can then test the distribution of exoplanets against the observed exoplanet distribution as well. So here the black is the data, the red is the prediction from a model. When we did this a few years ago, the exoplanet samples were not as large as they are now. Um, and also cutting the samples to make them complete in mass actually is quite restrictive. If you make them complete in mass, you throw out an awful lot of planets. Um, but the aim is to basically come up with a model we can test against both disk observations and planet observations. And so the, the paper I wrote with Phil, we basically found we were looking primarily at the disks and looking at you know, properties of transitional disks, which I don't have time to talk about. But we found it was more or less consistent with what's observed, but not desperately constraining in terms of the planet distribution because the data and the planets were still, we we're talking about a sample of about 30 objects at this time. Um, more recently, we looked at this again with, with Ilaria. And also, there's a few other papers that have tried to do 2D simulations of, of smaller numbers of objects, but in more detail to try and look at how the, the pro problem behaves in, in two dimensions, and they get similar answers. And basically, what we see is that if you, if you bin all the planets up into one bin, the distribution in radius is pretty smooth of the semi-major axis distribution, and more or less consistent with, with what we see in, in the exoplanet data. But the disk clearing process is not scale-free. Disk clearing for evaporations has a critical radius. And so a gap opens at a critical radius, and so planets which are migrating and encounter that gap behave differently depending on how massive they are, because they feel different torques, and the torques affect the planets depending on their mass. And so when we bin the distribution up by mass, we see features that depend on the planet mass and the, and the disk model. And the most prominent feature is shown here. So basically, this is a histogram of, of exoplanet data. The shaded histograms are uh, real exoplanet data. The, the dashed ones are the predictions from our reference model. It's not tweaked at all. And it's not perfect, but the mo it's, so the black bin is lower mass, Jupiter mass roughly, and the, the red bin is higher mass. And the most prominent feature you see in both of these things is this sort of pile-up of Jupiter mass planets roughly at 1 to 2 AU that's more or less consistent between the models and the, and the data. And this basically occurs because the, the lowest mass planets interact most strongly with the, the gap when it opens. And so they preferentially get stranded either just outside or just out inside the gap, the gap opening radius. Um, I'm not sort of going to push that this is the definite explanation for what we're seeing here. What I think it tells us is that basically there's, this is a way of testing models. The major parameter in the models that controls what happens here is actually how efficiently mass accretes over the planet's orbit. Because what's happening basically is the planet's migrating inwards, and at some point the evaporation takes over and beats the accretion flow. And so that depends on how efficiently mass is accreting past the planet. And so we're basically most sensitive to the, the physics of planetary accretion in these models, which is parameterized. But the, the more general suggestion is that basically we can, in principle, use the exoplanet distribution to test models of planet migration, planet formation, and, and disk physics. And I think that's potentially something that's quite exciting and hasn't really been explored in detail yet, but hopefully it's something we'll look into in a lot more detail over the next few years. So I'm, I'm basically at the end of my talk now. So I'm going to stick up my summary and, and highlight what I think the, the main things I want you to take away from this talk and to, to think about for the afternoon's talks. One is that basically planets form in evolving disks. 
Discs are not static. They evolve significantly. They accrete. They evaporate. They lose mass. And the dominant processes we think driving gas disc evolution are turbulent accretion and photoevaporation, although MRI-driven winds may also play a significant role. Um, photoevaporation, we observe it directly now. This is not just a theoretical process. We, we see blue shifted emission lines. We're, able, we're not quite, but we're almost able to measure mass loss rates. And so we can, we can really consider the impact in, in detail on s individual systems now. We've reached the point where basically disk evolution theory is moderately mature. The dominant uncertainties are input physics and things that are only going to be settled by, by future observations. Um, but what these, this theory means for planets and planetary systems is much less clear and something we're only beginning to scratch the surface of. And my, my point from the end of the talk was that basically one interesting thing is that disk dispersal physics and disk clearing might leave an observable signature in the, in the distribution of exoplanets. And we can potentially use exoplanets as a different anchor for our, our models of disk physics and planet formation rather than just testing them against the young disks. So that's about all I have to say today. So thank you very much for listening. Okay, Richard has left plenty of time for questions. Yeah, uh, a little under. Wants to start. Um, you alluded to this very briefly, um, but I was wondering if you could um, comment in a little bit more detail oh, on um, how you might expect, or if you expect, uh, disk dispersal driven by photoevaporation to, to change across the uh, uh, range of stellar masses. Um, because, you know, the radiation field that an, a G star sees is a little bit different than what, than what an M star sees. And we see some differences in the frequency of transitional disks across um, solar analogs to very, very low mass stars. Yeah, I, my position is that I'm pretty much agnostic on the mass dependence. I think the, the models are basically tested well against solar mass or, you know, traditional T tauri masses of a half to, to one solar mass. And there's a lot of data in that regime, and we think the models are fairly well anchored there. When you go down to the lower mass stars, as you say, the radiation fields are different, but also most of the parameters of the disks are not that well constrained in terms of the typical accretion rates, typical disk masses. When you look at disk masses of, of M dwarfs, you're typically only probing the upper end of the mass distribution. There's a lot of stuff you don't see. So I'm, yeah, I'm agnostic. There's, there's, a, there's observational evidence, certainly, that there is a mass dependence. Theoretically, there are a lot of free parameters in the models that are sort of anchored at solar mass level, and when you scale them down, there's enough play that you can scale the parameters to basically fit anything you want. And so I'm sort of, yeah, I don't have strong feelings on that one way or the other. Okay. Anyone else? Nobody else. It's terrifying. <laughs> James. Uh, thanks for the talk. Per perhaps you could flip back to the, your, your penultimate slide. This uh, so, so this, you, you marked here, RV surveys incomplete. Of course, this is where the next generation uh, direct imaging surveys are going to yeah. fill in. So let's be optimistic and say Sphere and GPI are going to fill in those bins and the trend continues instead of, what yeah, would your I would conclusion be? I would certainly hope so. I mean, I think it's, it's one of the things we sort of noted with these models is that we form the planets at sort of 5 to 10 AU and just inject them randomly because that's where we think planets form. At the moment, the RV surveys don't go out far enough to really test that, but you don't need to go much further out to start placing interesting limits on, on where and when planets form. And if, once you start detecting significant numbers of planets at 5, 10, 20 AU, then you can really say something about where planets form and when they form in, in these disks. And so, yeah, the question, I think, is whether or not the RV surveys move out or the, the direct imaging surveys get in quickly enough to fill that gap. And RV is, of course, a, a losing game to move further and further out because you have to wait longer and longer and longer and longer to get, to get any data. And so, yeah, I'm very optimistic that the the um, direct imaging surveys will, will fill that in. I'm not sure how long it'll take us to get into to 5 AU, but certainly at the 1020 AU, AU regime, there's going to get very, there'll be very interesting data in the next, the next few years from those kind of surveys. Ralph? Yes, wide angle uh, or large-scale MHD winds from disk have been yeah. predicted for a long time now. And I was just wondering, um, so given that that may be happening on larger scales, uh, this very scales that you've been talking about, photoevaporative flows, yeah. how would you observationally discriminate between the fact that that could be just an MHD disk wind um, versus the photoevaporative flow? Is it in the, the mass loss rates or is it the ionization structure? It's both, I think, ultimately. I mean, I think, as I said, the 
the observations that we have at the moment are clearly probing low velocity ionized winds. You see those directly. But as you say, there's a lot of degeneracy in the models, and you can do those in a variety of different ways. Um, I think the, the most promising way is basically looking at lots of different lines rather than just looking at them. So far, we've looked at the most the brightest, the easiest lines to, to look at. Once you start looking at different ionization states, probing molecular, atomic, ionized gas, and building up a detailed picture of how the wind works, then you can really start to distinguish between the different models and try and work out what's driving the, the dominant component of the mass loss. Um, also, I think spatially resolving the, 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 the wind emission makes a big difference, because in general, the, the, pr the predictions in terms of the, you know, the, the opening angles of the winds and, and where, where, where they go when they leave the disk are quite different. And so if you can start to get spatial resolution from things like spectroastrometry, then you can start to distinguish between the different models. So at the moment, we're seeing mass loss at some rate that's sort of 10 to the minus 10 or above, but you can't measure it empirically. I think we're not that far off being able to do empirical measurements and really distinguishing between the models. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, thanks. Following up from that question, how would you uh, envisage that the presence of a central uh, MHD wind in the innermost regions, or even the central regions of the of the disk, would modify or impact on the evaporating process uh, further out? So the general effect of a so this is the question: is you have an MHD wind or a jet emanating from the central, very close to the central star, how that affects the, the flow at wider angles? Basically, most of the jets that we see in the youngest stars are going to be very optically thick to high energy radiation. And so probably you won't have much evaporation at the youngest times until the jet has, has died away. Um, exactly how much attenuation you get depends on the jet structure. It also depends on whether you're talking about ionizing or non-ionizing or x-ray radiation. But in general, I think I expect the jet to, to uh, when there's a jet at small radii at very early times, that's going to inhibit the evaporation flow quite strongly just by absorbing all the photons. Okay, if there are uh, no more questions, let's thank Richard again. Thank you very much.